welcome to Talking Pictures. Uh, Michael Dow and myself, Mary Stack, are going to be chatting about uh, what's new and exciting in the world of cinema. And today we're looking at three films, three billboards, uh, Phantom Threads, and then both of us are going to discuss the film that got away. Both of us have uh, very strong feelings about why this film should have got an Oscar and didn't. So we're going to start off with uh, three billboards. Mike, mm -hmm. uh, what would you call that? Um, a revenge comedy with a surprising heart. <laughs> surprising heart. <laughs> and it's about as dark a comedy as I've seen in recent times. Yeah. There's certainly a few good laughs in there, but um, it's a deep, dark uh, plot. Uh, basically, it's a woman frustrated by the lack of police action over the brutal death of her daughter, the murder of her daughter. So she rents these three billboards mm -hmm. to goad the police into some kind of action. To embarrass and, them. Okay. To humiliate them, really, yeah. And so you like the use of media. Yeah, well, I like the use of media. I like the kind of the way in which she resorts to gimmickry to try to get their attention, to take this kind of crass commercial route. And the whole idea of using the billboards, I think, is cutely old school, which um, given that the, it's set in the fictional town, Ebbing, Missouri, you know, but it's set in a kind of place that most of us wouldn't have any sense of, let alone experience in. So I like the way she resorts to a kind of old school or old timey gimmick that is of using the billboards, which is like a Burma shave gag. You know, it's like driving by billboards and you look at them and it's like they're eye catching. The whole idea of like the advertising angle of catching people's imagination. And that's the only way that she can get anyone's attention because to actually take some kind of legal route is a failure. The system fails her. So it's an interesting kind of ironic twist in the film where they use, she uses kind of blatant commercialism to get her point across, which seems to be the only way these days, you know. And at the same time, typical Martin McDonough actually takes a sideway hit at mm -hmm. the actual ma mainstream media when she attacks the, the reporter for doing such an awful job yeah. of covering the story, yeah. which I also kind of liked. But for me, uh, I found it to be an amazing story of transformation, mm -hmm. believable transformation. This character, Sam Rockwell, yeah. who plays this racist pig yeah. who throws a man out of the window at one point, mm -hmm. suddenly I ended up forgiving and liking him, mm. which I could never have believed at the beginning of the film. Right. which was in large part my issue with the film. As I say, at least seeing it for the first time, you're paying almost too much attention to all the plot twists to really, I think, take into consideration the kind of, let's say, latent humanity with these characters. That they are, well, here's a couple of issues I have. One of which is that I had an issue with the caricature aspect of it, that Sam Rockwell's character is a bit of a cartoon character. It reminds me of a lot of other films that try to deal with gender politics in that regard, or racial politics, and oftentimes the men, the white men, are treated like cartoon characters or portrayed as such. But let's go to the flip side of that, mm -hmm. which is this horrible, infuriating, mm. dynamite heroine, I suppose, of mm. the film, uh, Frances McDormand, right. who behaves very badly. Right. Another, point, pro yeah. another problematic pedic character, which I'm not really entirely sure. It's like, am I supposed to identify with her? Because it, 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 the film taps into that kind of primal impulse we all have for revenge, right? Uh, kind of, you know, Old Testament retribution scenario. So y the audience is put in a position where you're being asked to identify or at least empathize with characters who are vile, you know, from the first, from the beginning. And I'd be especially curious with her character what you thought of in terms of, you know, is she a kind of feminist role model for us nowadays or is she the opposite? Is there some kind of parable there? I mean, what was your specific take with her character? Well, I think both the characters, both Sam and Frances McDormand, are driven to extremes. Yeah. Both of those characters They're forced, so they don't do these extremes. things out of free will. No. Okay. So I don't see it as revenge so yeah. much as someone seeking justice when she has nothing left to lose. Mm -hmm. He, I could believe, I've mm -hmm. met characters like that when I lived in Texas. Sure. They look like they're cartoon characters but they're not. Mm -hmm. So I think to expose the underbelly of that mm. thinking is a really valuable tool to us. Okay. These people are out there and they're operating in police departments Sure. with almost free reign. So you're comfortable with the caricature aspect or what at least I think appears mm. like caricature. Yeah, and also with hers. Even, the, you know, there were parts of her that made me embarrassed to be a woman. Yeah. 
And then the other parts, <laughs> well, what else, what other choice did the woman have, mm -hmm. you know, except to behave as brutally as the pig that was running the, the police department. Right, right. So, so I, I found it believable redemption. He didn't transform like a, a cartoon character overnight. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he's not a fixed man. He's right. just a man who's learning to become a human being. So my question That's then would be, can a character like that, who is just like racist to the point of cartoonishness, and you know, we know that those people, those types exist, right? Is it then convincing by the end that he turns out to not be that, or? Yes, yes, precisely. He's, he's raised with no education. Yeah. He's got this terribly dysfunctional mother. Right, which I also thought was a, a bit cliche as well. Oh no, it's just, I, I, see, I my, could believe that. My perspective is it's too easy to go there. It's too easy to say he's a mama's boy, and this is what causes his, you know. More than that, yeah. more than and that. And his mother's no male, feeding him this ideology of race, you no know. No male role model at all. Obviously very little education. Mm -hmm. But the child, I mean, I think it was the letter. Mm. It's the letter he gets from Woody Harrelson saying, you yeah. could be a good cop. Right. No one's ever said anything decent to this man in his whole yeah. life. Yeah. And I could believe that would happen. Right. This man thinks I have something to offer. So that's what it's, was the game changer. I understand. I, it still seems simplistic to me. I mean, you know, on a, just a tad simplistic. Worth a second view. Absolutely. Well, that's my point too with this film, because it's like, as I say, you pay so much attention to content, which is something I don't typically do. I, I try to pay more attention to style and the way in which a story is told. But this one, it's so dense with, okay, every five minutes, some radical plot shift occurs. Um, so it is the kind of film you need to revisit, I think, to consider it on its moral grounds or lack thereof. You know, my question to you would be, to have a kind of outsider's perspective on the culture, what's your take on that? Do you think that it's, I, I tend to find it more refreshing when a filmmaker from, you know, another country kind of steps in and applies their perspective to American, you know, Americana. I totally totally concur with that. It's all, it, many times it's much more interesting than we try to self-analyze, you know, it seems I, to fail. I concur because you don't come forearmed with all the prejudices and social mores. Yeah. You're walking into this somewhat right. fresh yeah. and trying to make sense of it. Yeah. it. And you know his work really well, so he deals with these themes in he other... He does, in yeah. plays, okay. remarkably well. Yeah. And he pummels the depths of uh, what we're capable of, yeah. which is horrible stuff, yeah. dark, dark, murky stuff. But there's always this innate need for redemption, mm -hmm. grace yeah. at the end of it. So yeah. it's got to be his Catholic so there's a, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Religion always intervenes. Okay, so Phantom Thread. Uh-oh. Thread. <laughs> All right. So I like the fact that you said you, you are interested in content, uh, form. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in content because that's the way we naturally fall on this and these most of these arguments. Well, movies are always we're always inclined to follow content. I mean, we have to kind of be a slave to it because you need to know what the what is, you know? It's Well, I'm glad you said that because we're going to come to a film okay. now that I think the director is somewhat indulgent in that he just likes to play around with the film mm -hmm. and notional ideas yeah. and he doesn't care if you get it, or you're right. following. Or for that matter, whether or not the degree of the narrative is consistently coherent, which Phantom Thread can be accused of lacking in coherence, whether it's overt or implicit coherence. Because by the time you get to the end of the film, there's still a question mark. It's like, what happened? What am I, what's the conclusion I'm supposed to draw here? You know? That so we should set up the film. Yes. It, it's set <laughs> in 1950s in London. Yep. And Reynolds Woodcock is a renowned dressmaker mm -hmm. whose fastidious life is disrupted by the arrival of this younger, very strong-willed woman called Alma, who becomes first his muse and then his lover. Whom, and whom he willfully invites into his life. I think it's just Indeed, a key difference. Indeed, entices, one could say. Yes. She's a waitress in, in the opening scene, mm -hmm. and he's quite charming. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a very uh, deep... Okay, I love <laughs> certain performances in the film. Yeah. I do love Daniel Day-Lewis, and yes. I would see him in a brown bag uh, performance. But anyway, the costumes, of course, were to die for. Uh, but I found this a very odd film mm -hmm. in several ways. As so, in rubbing you the wrong way kind of odd? Oh, it didn't come, it didn't fall together. It didn't hang together coherently. Mm -hmm. There was an implausibility about it that mm -hmm. left me feeling wanting. 
Um, or maybe I just don't like to think that kind of level of dysfunction is out there right. operating under the banner of relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what bothers me about it. Yeah, it's one of those films that's rather unusual in, in terms of talking about it. Uh, because you don't want to give away too much mm. because there are these subtle yet radical shifts in terms of the dynamics of their relationship. So it's hard to, in that regard, talk about the content of the film without giving things away. But I think in many respects the way I read the film um, is that, again, in the most ironic sense, it actually has a kind of happy ending. And I think if you look at what Paul Thomas Anderson is doing as the writer and director, that he is trying to get at the sadomasochistic underpinning dynamics of what relationships, I don't want to say always are, but tend to be, okay? Whoa. Yeah, that it seems to me, I mean, if you want to kind of go along with this proposal, and I'm not saying that the film is necessarily successful at kind of establishing this kind of subtle theme, but I really do think that the film tends to get at, uh, you know, how or what partners do for one another, okay? And both characters in the film are severely dysfunctional, and yet, they are in this, let's just say, kind of pathetic way, suitable for one another. Yeah, like he does, he chooses this woman and she serves a purpose in his life and she fulfills that purpose. You see, there's way too much logic in that for me because mm -hmm. it's, it's much more that he sees her as a muse initially, and that also he's gonna dress and in a kind of dolly fashion. Because he's got this kind of slavish method of operating. Yes. He's got all these drones this that absolutely follow yeah. his whims yes. and make these frocks precisely. Mm -hmm. He even puts little handwritten notes yeah. inside the garments mm -hmm. so that they are just works of art. He's got this insidious way of mm -hmm. inveigling his way into the very fabric of these people's lives yeah. without, them their, knowing. without them knowing. Right. It's like he's branding them or imprinting right, them. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so that pit was very sinister. But the thing, the, the thing I did like, there was a theme that I did like in him, mm -hmm. in Woodcock. And that was because he got very upset at one point because his sister, who is called Cyril, there's yeah. another little and strange he calls twist. Her his so-and-so. His so-and-so. Which again already establishes this ambiguity that's never <laughs> right, resolved. Right, right. So yep. Cyril says he's lost a very important customer because uh, his dresses were not chic enough. Mm -hmm. And he goes berserk. Oh, his speech about chic is about chic. Oscar worthy alone. Right. Um, and I like that, that nice kind of uh, conflict mm -hmm. that he represented between his important lofty ideals of art and mm -hmm. his creations and the marketplace yep. which dictated you had to kind of sell your goods yeah. which was an anathema to him he didn't like that at all right and he's right culturally he's right in a position where that shift is taking place like the dressmaker Correct. as the master artisan Stopped you know the, uh, yeah being taken over more by the kind of brand mentality of the 60s and you know the changing in fashion sense um, but i was going to ask you too because i initially thought as you did in terms of thinking about her as a muse. But the, I think the more consistent suggestion in the film is that he's looking for a mother replacement. But he has visions of his mother, he, um, he can't really get over it, and he's constantly trying to replace her. And that's why I see it in a, in a severely dysfunctional, pathetic way, a kind of happy ending, because she finds her cause in his life, you know, and effectively becomes the surrogate mother to him. But I almost didn't really see that as being a dominant uh, mm -hmm. theme, mm -hmm. the mother. Because right from the beginning, his first monologue, and he's got a number of mini monologues mm. in the film that are fantastic, mm. but when he talks about it, he says, I still dream of mother, I still can smell her. You know? And the way in which the film plays so much, you talk about form in the film, how much it plays on sensuality. You know, the, the texture, the tactile texture of the dresses or the food that's being prepared in the film, the constant kind of almost fetishistic emphasis on food. I mean, the film really kind of heightens the sensual. And to tie that in with his mother complex, and the way he describes his mother in sensual terms, you know, it's as if it's the only thing that he's ultimately in search of. You know, something that's beyond his work, you know. And maybe the work ties into that, I don't know. Well, that, that, uh, that's certainly interesting because I miss that. I miss yeah. the importance of that. Yeah. The things that really bothered me a lot were the exaggerations in the film that mm -hmm. almost stuck in my throat. Exaggerations one was, of? Here, here, one, one, the point at which they don't like a woman falling 
drunk asleep in bed mm -hmm. in one of his creations and the two of them go in and pull the dress off this woman mm -hmm. this unconscious woman it was oh, yeah. very odd i couldn't understand the reason for that mm -hmm. the second thing that seemed totally exaggerated you're talking about the essential which yeah. was lovely right was how they played up and over amplified the sound of her eating toast and things like this yes there's no way anybody eats toast like that unless their face is over a microphone yeah um and suddenly, you know, his, if they had started with it normally and him over amplifying it and over amplifying it as you would if you're OCD, mm -hmm. which I think he might have been, yeah. um, that, that would fly. That didn't work for me. But the other one, what about that dress? Did, what did you take away There's from so, that? I mean, well, with her character, the Alma character specifically, I'm supposed to accept that she's some kind of Philistine. Like she doesn't have any kind of cultural yeah. acumen or any kind of cultural right. education whatsoever. But that's not really exposed in any way beyond just her like overt vulgarity at the table the way she you know behaves so that's a bit of an inconsistency there are these odd tonal shifts in the film where either you go with it or you don't i mean there's that one uh which is very extreme and played comedically but without humor some it's not really a funny scene it's very mm. awkward it's just to say i think what anderson was trying to go for whether it works or not is these these ruptures of the tonality of the film. And the tone of the film, I think, is meant to reflect his subjectivity. So that when one tiny little thing gets out of hand, he completely overreacts, I mean, to such an excessive extreme. So there's a consistency in those moments of disruption in the film that I found as though they belong there. Whether they succeed on their own is another matter. But I understand why they're there. I think it speaks to his absolute he, control right. aspect of everything in his life. Yeah. This army of dependents that, that right. make his creations possible. Right. And, and the tonal extremes are like reflections of his neurotic, you know, conflicts. Incredible. Like yeah. when she wants to make him dinner mm -hmm. and Cyril says, mm, I don't think he'll like that. Right. Well, and then she makes work. it with butter instead of... Yeah, yeah, she cooks something yeah. with butter. And, and that's what leads to the huge... Huge! Yeah. Just like in any marriage, or just like in any relationship, the little thing. Ultimately, for me, the film succeeds relative to at least Paul Thomas Anderson's career. Because I generally don't enjoy his films. I find his work toxically pretentious. I think there's a, a poor wedding between content and form. A film like Boogie Nights is supposed, should be a fun film, but he treats it like some kind of you know, Greek tragedy. Uh, whereas with this film, the subject matter, the pretentiousness of the subject matter and the characters, for me, was a perfect union with his mm. sensibility as a director. Mm. Mm. Certainly the field of fashion was the perfect fit for that. Exactly. And I'm not the kind of person where it's like a Paul Thomas Anders film or mm. another mm. one. Mm. Mm. You know. Mm. So for me, it was a pleasant surprise in that regard, at least in terms of his canon of work. Yeah. So to me, it wasn't so much a happy ending. It was... It's a happy ending she, for the two characters. She loves him <laughs> and he loves his work. That's what I took away with it. But I think he, okay. That, that was my But I think he ultimately loves his mother. <laughs> That's why it's a happy ending. Okay. Touche. Yeah. So now we're going to just individually uh, talk about the films that really went under the radar or missed enough of the accolades this year um, in the Oscars. Um, and Michael's got one in particular, which actually did get nominated. Mm -hmm. um, For the, it was the one wrong nomination, I felt, but maybe we'll get to that. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about one that, that didn't even get nominated at all. And that's really upsetting. When you go to a film twice, it's so good, mm -hmm. and it doesn't even get a mention. So first to you. Oh. The well, Florida Project. Yes, my pick is The Florida Project. Um, which I found to be the most pleasant surprise. And this one I found both in terms of my own experience with it and as well as audience reaction. It's the kind of film that does really kind of trigger extreme reactions by design from the audience. You either love it or you hate it. But it's usually people seem to not like it mainly because the subject matter itself is so disagreeable. It's set just outside Orlando. It obviously has to be geographically in terms of what happens with the film. And it's simply nothing more, nothing less than a film that focuses on an extremely dysfunctional mother and her uh, wayward daughter and the people who live in this rundown motel and their experiences with one another. And there's really not much of a plot. I mean, that's a big part of why I like it. It's really much more of a slice of life film. It just shows 
you know, it, it kind of sheds light on a particular way of life. And of course, I've been to Florida several times, and you go immediately outside Disney World, and this is the world you experience, mm. the world of these real people. And that's in large part, I think, why uh, so many people had a kind of violent reaction against it in many respects was because it was the simple question. It's like, my God, people live this way? Wow, this is, you know. But I found it from beginning to end very convincing uh, that the, the uh, actors, mainly actresses who were chosen for the film, uh, were in effect chosen more because they suited the type of the character, that they weren't professional actors. They don't, you know, with the exception of William Defoe. Uh, so there's a certain kind of realism to it that reminded me of, to a degree, Italian neorealism. I mean, it's mm. similar in many respects to Bicycle Thieves, mm. if you've seen that mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. Some, nothing necessarily dramatic happens in that film except at the beginning and at the end, much like in Florida Project. Mm. Mm. So really it is just an almost documentary-like way of interrogating or exploring a very particular uh, way of life in America. And that's, those are the kinds of films I really like. You know, it's, it's in the tradition of Mike Lee and, and other like extraordinarily important realist directors. Okay, I've got a couple of things. Oh, I was a little, more than a little disturbed by this. I don't think I would have been so upset if it had been a documentary. Yeah. Somehow I would have been able to handle the fact. Yeah. But the, the little girl who sees some atrocious things mm -hmm. um, it just bothered me. I, she could only have been seven or eight, maybe 10 at mm -hmm. tops. Yeah. And it just, I wondered how they shot that film without this kid right. being impacted. I mean, I know you can be very clever, but it was a low budget film. Yeah. My second question is, why did William Defoe do it? I mean, it really wasn't a big well, role. Well, exactly. And this is, well, this is my problem with the Oscars. I mean, one of many, right? But this is one of those where it's like, okay, of course they're going to nominate the one professional in the film. And, you know, fortunately it's William Defoe who can kind of mm. tone down mm. his, what, professionalism and fit in effectively. But to even think that William, the, I mean, I don't know exactly what the casting was. It's not quite stunt casting. But even just having him in the film was the one thing that kind of removed me from the immediacy of it. Because mm. I kept remembering, it's like, okay, here's William Defoe playing an average mm. guy. You know, <laughs> Even though he's extremely convincing in that regard. Mm. But still there was that. And then for the Oscars to nominate him and to otherwise ignore the film mm. bothered me. Mm. You know, mm. Providing you know, I'm supposed to care about the Oscars, which you know, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But I thought that the film otherwise deserved a lot more attention, at least a writing credit or something along those lines. Mm. Um, and as far as the performance of the little girl is concerned, again, yeah, there's always the concern there that there's some degree of exploitation. Um, my impression was, and again, not obviously knowing these people, but my impression was that so much of the film consists of, okay, here's the scenario. You're hanging out in the street or you know, at the motel with your friend. And then they just let the cameras roll. I mean, it seemed that way, that there was guidance and there was scripting. Mm, but mm. The, I, I, found, I found the most charming moments in the film were those moments that seemed to just be happening. And again, we can address the degree to which, you know, just the mere fact that the child is being set up as the protagonist of the film, that that alone is too much pressure for a child, mm. that's, that could be an issue. Mm, mm. But I didn't necessarily get that sense that the child was being like overly coached or manipulated in the performance no, but, at least. I mean, there's obviously that dodgy character lurking and William the, Defoe throws oh, that the pedophile, the, the yeah, pedophile. Yeah. but then there's the man that she brings home who walks in on the little girl having her bath. Right, but they handle that very tastefully. Yeah, I mean, they the, did, it's but not, I think this, I was just scared a lot of the time Right, in but that what's film. disturbing about that is, you know, once you, once you come to realize what the mother's really doing, and how much is occurring off screen, we're really kind of relegated to the subjectivity of the little girl, which I thought was a, almost a tender way to handle those scenarios. You know, rather than rubbing our noses, unlike mm, something like mm, a three billboards, mm. here we don't really see that yeah, stuff. Yeah, she's so, playing with Barbie. Yeah, and, and so, but it has, I think, much more of a kind of psychological, there's more of a psychological effectiveness to that because we find ourselves, as you did, I think, empathizing with that girl to such a degree where we begin to worry about exploitation not just in terms of the character in the film, but almost spilling out beyond mm. the film. Is that a kind mm. of concern? Mm. Is that what mm. you're thinking? Or well, then is it, it, then it, it might worked. just be the, the, the degree then of effectiveness worked. of the film. You that know? it is disturbing, that film, yeah. and it should disturb you. And the one other point I wanted to make, especially to give people the, something to think about as they watch the film, to consider the way in which it deals with Disney and the Disney effect. Especially with the little girl, the, the whole idea of like the princess mentality and how the little girl thinks that her only way out of this untenable world her mother has put her in is to escape to the Magic Kingdom, mm, you know? Mm. 
Okay, on a, on a more optimistic <laughs> note, com which comes off of that, yeah. this leads to the Maudie film, mm -hmm. which I was so madly in love with. Right. Uh, similar, similar in some ways. Yeah, very. Yeah. So another bad category in the Oscars, which I only discovered today, mm. because I was so incensed that Sally Hawkins, who I think is one of the most talented young actresses out there, mm -hmm. um, did not get nominated for Maudie, because apparently you can't be nominated for two awards uh, in the same in the Oscars. Single category. Yeah, in the same category. So she got no nominated for The Shape of Water, which was an epic film. And she, and she should have won for that. She should I have felt. won. T two sins. That one, she wasn't acknowledged for mm -hmm. being best actress. Secondly, Ethan Hawke in Maudie. First time I've ever liked him. Can I just say that? I, I actually have to agree with you. Yeah, this that he is felt a man like he was inside the skin of the character. Had really done work. Yes. And it was raw and it was brutal again. Mm -hmm. But again, now another transformative Okay, but here's character. a film where you have a male character who is every bit as brutal as Sam Rockwell's character in Three Billboards, but his Absolutely. transformation for me was a hundred times more convincing. That he was really just a broken man, he was wounded, he was you know, very much like a hermit, he, was ex he lived in seclusion, and he simply didn't know how to behave with you know, anyone on an intimate level, but especially with a woman he finds himself I assume falling in love with, you know, or at least relying upon to such the degree that they needed each other. You know, I found his transformation absolutely extraordinary, and I wouldn't consider him anywhere near the echelon of talent as someone like a Sam Rockwell. So his performance, you know, was really revelatory in that regard. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And, and the, again, the body language mm -hmm. that she had to play a girl who had some sort of crippling... Severe arthritis, yeah. yeah, yeah. Crippling arthritis. Yeah. And um, how she managed to, to actually hobble across those bridges, and <laughs> she always seemed to be wearing the wrong shoes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so this is a true story of an artist uh, in Nova mm -hmm. Scotia who um, was really stuck answering an ad and, and takes a job as a housekeeper mm -hmm. with Ethan Hawke, who's this brutal, uh, dysfunctional fisherman who lives in a hut, literally. Mm -hmm. And she applies as the job of housekeeper and somehow against all the odds keeps it, even being beaten at one point, um, and then develops her own little art thing on the side. Mm -hmm. And it's a true story. Her, yeah. her art ends up in, in the White House. Yeah, and what's, ex and what's extraordinary is that it's not, she has her paintings and she tries to have her own little business with this, but what's really lovely about it in this kind of fragile way is that she transforms his world into a work of art. You know, she paints the house, mm. the interiors, and she brings, she brings that convergence of life and art, she fuses them together. And what's extraordinary again is because it's through his eyes, in many respects, that we see this transformation. You know, and we come to see what she's doing through him. And again, a character who is vile on the surface, but extremely warm-hearted and, and desperate for that degree of connection with another human being. And I like the way she brings beauty, literally brings beauty into his life through her art. It's, Absolutely. it's extraordinary. She, she, that, that was the thing, that, that it was the Vincent van Gogh thing of seeing beauty everywhere. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't help herself. At, in, even if it was a freezing cold day and they were in that hut and mm -hmm. she'd look out the window and she'd just be, she'd light up when she'd see the trees. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it's I, a I, wonderful kind of contrast between those moments of kind of contemplative beauty through her art and, and nature. And as you say, the way in which the film does not shy away from violence of a physical nature but also of a sexual nature you know mm -hmm. it really the film is very honest and it treats that subject matter in a very mature way you know so that you can kind of again empathize with characters you wouldn't normally or typically consider yourself capable you know going back to the point that you raised about mm -hmm. you found his transformation so much more believable than sam rockwell's mm -hmm. well i would say the reason perhaps mm -hmm. is yeah. This was done over like a 30-year span, right. this film. Yeah. They start off and they end up being very old together. Okay, Mike. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. See you next week. Yes, absolutely.